will be uh, discussing uh, the very interesting uh, topic of uh, surgical instruments described by Sushurta. Uh, this is one of the uh, admirable legacies of uh, Ayurveda widely acclaimed uh, reputed very greatly for the skill for the innovation etc in the design of uh, surgical instruments. Now in this I will be dealing with the classification of uh, the large number of instruments the blunt instruments which uh, greatly exceeded in number the sharp instruments 100 blunt instruments called yantras by Sushruta sharp instruments 20 in number called shastras supportive instruments and the instruments as indicators of the status of technology and surgery in ancient India. I would like to uh, spend some time on that general subjects, subject which flows out of these instruments. Now the, the very uh, diverse type of operations which uh, Sushruta described, some of which we have referred to uh, they would call for a variety of uh, instruments, uh, very different in uh, design, uh, very different in uh, purpose and uh, so on. And uh, the, all the surgical trainees, surgeons, they had to familiarize themselves uh, with the use of these instruments. Uh, that was one essential part of uh, surgical training. Uh, we have seen that uh, students uh, who wanted to train in uh, Shalya in uh, surgery, they had to spend a lot of time uh, using experimental models in familiarizing themselves with the use of these instruments. And Sushruta makes it clear that these instruments should be made of high quality iron, that is what he says, and they should be made by experts in uh, the craftsmanship in this instrumentation, what he calls karma kovidas, experts in the production or design and making of these instruments and uh, the dimensions of the instruments, the shape, other details, how the surgeon should handle, all these are uh, described with great care and the method of cleaning the instruments after use, how to store them, all these are uh, described in great detail indicating the importance they attached to surgical instruments. And the most of the surgical procedures, a large number of them anyway, uh, they had to deal with the removal of uh, foreign bodies. In fact, 20 foreign bodies are described, splinters, arrowheads, etc. And the removal of these from all parts of the body, sometimes very awkward, all these had to be served by the use of these instruments. So the design called for a good deal of uh, ingenuity, which we will see as we go along. And also it indicates to have this kind of uh, a surgical armamentarium made, it required not only uh, good craftsmen, uh, good quality of uh, iron being available, but it also indicates there must have been a good deal of interaction between a very vigorous surgical profession and the craftsman. Because craftsmen alone will not be able to design this because they have no idea what these are used for, the particular surgical application whether it is removal of a bladder stone, whether removal of incising and abscess, these are very different purposes. So even today, a company manufacturing surgical instruments, are they always have surgeons as their consultants because they are the people who give ideas uh, what these instruments are used for, how they are used. So similarly in Sushruta's time also, a very good group of craftsmen, a guild for example, and very good quality iron available. Uh, those two will not produce surgical instruments. You need a very good source of surgical information. Obviously, that also existed in uh, Sushruta's time. That is a very important point. Now, in classification, blunt instruments, there are 100. Sharp instruments, there are 20. And supportive instruments, a large number of them, they are really not instruments as you will see. Many of them are materials which are used. Now, here, you can see the blunt instruments. What I have done is try to group this as best as I could. And uh, these are used essentially for extraction of foreign bodies in various parts of the body, 
loosening of foreign bodies if they are impacted inside, opposing the edges of wound before suturing, pulling out things and so on. So these are various purposes for which these forceps are used. Now the first group of forceps, there are 10 of them. Forceps is the general grouping, swastika and subtypes, there are 10 subtypes. Now each of these, the functions are pulling out impacted foreign bodies. Uh, they may be splinters, some of them may be, may be very fragile like glass for example, you have to pull out with great care otherwise it may splinter. So each of these will have a different purpose, different type of usage but what you should observe here, one is the user friendly because obviously these are designed in consultation with the user, so they are user friendly, users know how to use it and secondly there is a lot of aesthetic in this. Because all these instruments, for example, in the first, uh, the 10 subtypes, they are all the business end of the instrument is shaped after animals which are very familiar. For example, the first one, lion face, uh, that is, you can see here, and the next one is a tiger face. Now this is how all these instruments, the business end is named after a particular animal and that animal is well known to the Indian people. Now this lion face, the first one, next is a tiger face and we go on. Next is wolf face, bear faced, hyena faced, panther faced. So these are all different type of uh, business end of the instrument. It gives a good grip on the foreign body. If it is impacted, they have a good grip, they can pull it out. And the way it is shaped, it can go into different body cavities, different muscles or tendons, joints, wherever it gets impacted, they get hold of it and they can pull it out. And it is the surgeon's discretion to use which particular instrument that they should use. So these are all the swastikas which are used for this purpose. Then we come to cat face. Jacquard face, deer face, crocodile face, each one of them you can see how ingenious they are. There is a lot of aesthetics also in this. It is not only the utility, uh, the user friendliness, uh, but also uh, the aesthetics of design. And we go on to heron forceps. Now here there are 15 types, they are of a different kind uh, because these are used to pull out deep seated foreign bodies. That is where they are bird faced, mostly they have shaped after birds, here heron forceps, eagle forceps, crow forceps, osprey forceps. Now the earlier ones were all based on animals and here they are all birds, so the design has changed. And uh, blue jay forceps, hawk forceps, owl forceps, kite forceps. Vulture forceps, falcon forceps, curlew forceps, butcher bird forceps. So you can see the how the great uh, variety of uh, forceps used for a variety of uh, purposes, taking out uh, from surface or from depth. Now here we move to the next uh, category, it is also forceps. But it is Sardamsa, which is a different purpose. It, has, it may have two arms or it may be without arms. But these are used for other purposes like depilation, removing hair or remove deep seated slough. Suppose there is an ulceration going on, dead tissue is at a depth. You do not need tough big forceps to pull it out, it is too fragile. So you might use the, uh, these forceps here without arms, Sardamsa, that could be used. So that is another type. Then we come to Talayantras, which is a, a different purpose altogether. These are used for removing wax from the ear, for example, or extracting foreign bodies from the nose in children or ear. There, it is a different purpose altogether. It may be a single blade ektala or it may be double dvitala. So these are two different types. They are also forceps, but different from what we have seen earlier. Then we come to, a, a, to another kind of blunt instruments, these are nadi yantras. They may have openings at both ends or it may be only one side and the most uh, 
familiar and important are these uh, what we call tubular instruments which are used for visualizing endoscopes in today's term to visualize the interior of uh, body cavities and the most commonly used are anal fistula and uh, piles for these two common conditions for which surgical operations or procedures may be required you use these uh, nadi yantras now, now here we have two instruments looking very similar to each other on the left hand side we have the anal fistula instrument with two slits and on the right hand side we have the piles instrument again with two slits now these instruments essentially very similar but the difference is for the piles arsho yantra the two slits are wider because when you proceed on operating on piles you need more space to operate you have to put in instruments and you may have to do manipulation you may have to do excision and so on you may have to turn it around and see whether it is effective then you have to turn it back a certain amount of manipulation is necessary more in the case of the piles instrument than in the case of the anal fistula instrument so that is the only difference in the uh, depth it, it should go and also the size of these uh, slits that is the only difference otherwise they are very similar uh, they look alike but the purpose is somewhat different whereas anal fistula you don't have to do so much of visualization inside most of the operation is done on the anal verge or outside so the procedure is uh, somewhat different in the case of bhagandara or fistula whereas in piles you have to do manipulation through the slit of the instrument and when it comes to the wound syringe that is used for irrigating areas of the body inside it can even be used through these endoscopes if necessary for example the inner opening of a fistula if you want to irrigate it after a particular procedure you can use this wound syringe varana vasti that is the term which is used for that then we have other tubular instruments uh, one of them is uh, paracentesis or tapping tapping is if you have a collection of fluid in the abdomen what is called dropsy if you want to drain that fluid uh, this a small skin incision is made and through that this nadi yantra is introduced so that slowly you can drain this it is very important that you don't drain it all together quickly because that can produce uh, dangers so essentially it is a small tube through which the drainage takes place very slowly that is how the nadi yantra for paracentesis or tapping the dropsy in the abdominal cavity and a similar instrument still smaller is used for tapping hydrocele which is also a collection of fluid it should, should be drained slowly and that again is a similar instrument a nadi yantra now here you have a whole lot of uh, these tubular instruments and on the left hand side is a vaginal speculum because that was used for irrigating the vagina for various disease conditions and then on the right hand side you see urethral dilators uh, these are not uh, tubes they are blunt uh, instruments in other words the entire it is a solid tube of different dimensions starting from very small to larger diameter this tells us immediately that in those days urethral stricture uh, was not uncommon and urethral stricture the most common cause is gonorrhea so one has to assume that if urethral strictures were dilated with these instruments they must have been gonorrhea at that time they must have been urethral strictures otherwise these dilators are hardly ever used and a similar type much less used is the rectal strictures and there again a similar rectal dilators are used these are not tubes they are solid rods uh, they are used for dilatation again these are repeatedly done you cannot cure the stricture by using this but patients get substantial relief but they have to come again after some time for another uh, process of uh, dilatation and urethral cannulas again if you want to drain urine through a narrowed area you can use this urethral uh, cannula and once again like uh, uh, irrigation a bulb with a tube so that you can irrigate urethra just like the rectal cannula then we come to shalakas these are solid rods which are used for various purposes 
for example, and all shaped very differently, earthworm like uh, probe. These are probes. If you want to, there is a, a sinus, a channel, and you want to know which way that channel is going. You want to probe it. Now, it is that kind of purpose, and you feel there is a foreign body somewhere. Can you track it somehow using an instrument? It is a, this kind of purpose that these rod like instruments, shalakas, are used, earthworm like, fish hook like arrow wing type, so many lentil pulse type, the blunt tip so that it does not do any damage. Whereas the arrow head, if you have to go through a narrowed area, you have to use some pressure, there are no vital structures, then a blunt instruments can hardly go through that fibrous stricture area. You need something sharp, you would use the arrow wing tip, snake hood tip and the swab holding probe. So, all these are, the tips are different depending on what you need, whether it is a blunt tip can be used, preferably you would use that. If a sharp tip is necessary, you would use that. But these are all essentially shalaka type of instruments and uh, that is another type. And we go on with more shalaka type and you may also recall that this shalaka simply means a rod and this is what was used in uh, uh, Jivaka's uh, examination in uh, Takshashila. At that time, the Jataka tales talk about a, an examination when a patient, a, stu, a student has finished his uh, training, uh, he has to subject himself to a test. And one of the tests, a theoretical test was in an assembly of students and uh, scholars sitting around. The student has to come and a text would be kept there with a shalaka, it is called shalaka test on a particular page. So, he has to come and open this and whatever he sees there, that subject he has got to discuss to the satisfaction of the assembly. It must have been a shalaka, something like this, a simply a rod uh, which was kept there. So, shalaka name is quite famous that way in Ayurveda. Now, here again, these are used for a whole variety of purposes like a jamul seed, the tip, a bud shaped tip, half moon shaped tip and uh, a fetal traction hook. That is an important uh, uh, purpose because if you have a dead fetus, that is a very serious condition, a uh, woman is very sick and the fetus is dead, it is stuck inside, how do you take it out? This is one of the most dangerous uh, procedures and the surgeon had to get special permission from the king to do this. And if you have to take out that obstructing fetus, often you have got to, suppose the shoulder is obstructing, with a knife he has to cut that shoulder and to extract that fetus, he has to have a good grip and that is where he would use this fetal traction hook that is introduced a good grip on the uh, fetus body some part and then it is extracted. So, it is used for that purpose. Now, we come to the, these are all examples of uh, blunt instruments. I have taken examples from different categories, solid instruments, tubular instruments, forceps and so on. Now, we come to the sharp instruments. Uh, these are uh, 20 in uh, type. One is mandalagra, which is a round tipped uh, knife, such as we do not use it very often, but in those days it was a very commonly used instrument for incision and scraping it was used. And it was six angulas long. An angula is the width of a middle finger of an adult, average adult. That was the measure that was used for every instrument that the dimension is mentioned. Then karapatra, serrated edge. This is used if, for example, you have to divide a bone. Uh, this was the karapatra was used. Vrithipatra, bent or straight tip for incision and excision. Nakasastra, which was uh, for pairing nails. And mudriga was a knife which was put around the finger so that you can use it, manipulate it and cut as you like. These are not instruments we use now. Utpala patra blade one angular long, total length is six inches. Arthathara, that is the, you will see a picture of that. Inside there is a sharp flat, on the outside it is curved. That is a very, the blades are very peculiarly shaped. You will see that six angulas long. Suchi, different types of uh, uh, needles, curved needles, straight needles, etc. Kushapatra, Again, blade one angular long, handle is three angulas long, it is used for drainage. Atibukha, it is the shape of a, of a bird, 
the mouth is faced like that, it is used for drainage again, sarari mukha, scissors, uh, mouth like sarari bird, antar mukha, sabilunar in shape, eight angulas long and trikur chaka has three blades. So these are different types of uh, sharp instruments. Then kutharika, it is used for making puncturing and vrihi mukha is for puncturing again. The tip is placed like a paddy, that's why it is called vrihi mukha. Then ara, shaped like an owl. Vedasapatrika, shaped like a willow leaf. Badisha is again taking a hook, especially used for taking out foreign materials which are impacted. Danta shanku is a dental scaler. And eshani is again a probe used for probing. Many of them are same purpose. Uh, but often a surgeon you will find a particular sinus tracking, one particular probe does not work, you may have to try something else. So a, a certain amount of choice has to be available in the use of these instruments. Similarly scissors, all these uh, one single instrument design will not do. You have to have a variety available to suit a particular purpose. Now here are the examples, this is the first one, you see the mandalagra, that circular knife then the karapatra which is used for sawing the bone, straight tipped scalpel, then phlebotome. We talked earlier about how to do phlebotomy. A small skin incision is made on a, exactly over a vein which is made prominent and through that only the vein is drained. Now this is used for that with a sharp tip and there is a half edge knife which is also used for a similar purpose making very small precise incisions. Then the different types of uh, needles, suji, the straight needle on the left, a full curved, half curved, different types of needles and the tips are also different. That curved needle if you look, that is a round body needle, whereas the one below that, it has got a three edges to the tip. So that is much sharper if you want to pass your needle through hard tissues like tendon, ligament, then you would use the one with a three edges. Now this again is the for drainage purposes, small incisions are to be made, both are used for a similar purpose. Now here are scissors, again the mouth is based on the shape of a bird, Sarari bird, this was the favorite of design of birds or animals and puncturing instruments, Kutariga and semilunar shaped uh, scissors, antarbukha, the flat inside and a curved outside. So obviously it is to introduce into some body cavity and cut. It looks like it is designed like that, that curved exterior. And trikurchaga is a three bladed instrument. Now then we have a trocar. Trocar is used for making a puncture for drainage purposes. All all is used for making, if you want to pierce the bone, pass a wire through that, that is used for bone all. And then we have double edged uh, knife, sharp hook again, badisha, dental scaler and probes of different kind. There are very many different types of uh, asianis or probes. Now these are the uh, classical blunt and uh, sharp instruments, we have illustrated some of them just to give you an idea of the kind of instrumentation that was available to the surgeons in the remote past. Now this will not do, so a great many others which are called Anushastras, but they are really not uh, instruments, but they were necessary for the surgeon for his uh, surgical procedure. Now here you have bamboo strips, glass, rock, crystals, fingernails and most important uh, Sushrata points out in these surgeon's fingers, they are the most important according to him and alkali, leeches, cautery, sprouts, finger and here you can see the functions of that. When children are fearful of knife, that is when you would use bamboo strips or glass etc. And alkali, leeches, cautery, we have had a full discussion of that and for exploration when the probes are not available, you have to use your finger. Now the, the, it is important here 
the surgical instruments we have simply listed all these. As some of you will know, Shakespeare said, there are sermons in stone, stones are talking to us. Now similarly, these surgical instruments, apart from their utility, they are also telling us something about the status of uh, technology, about the status of surgery, all that, what has it existed in the remote past. Now that is an important issue which is very much like the uh, sermons, a stone talking to us, giving us a sermon. So here these instruments are also telling us something much wider, much greater significance so that I thought I should spend a little time on this unusual subject. Because the design and development of such a wide range of instruments for precision use in surgery would hardly be possible in the absence of metallurgy and metal craft of a very high order. That is very obvious. Now this is not difficult to understand because advanced metallurgy existed. We all know that in Mauryan times they had these Mauryan columns made. There is one Ashoka pillar standing in Delhi even today, rustless. It has no rust. It has got a polish. It was made at that time. So the metallurgy of a very high order existed at that time. That is understandable enough. And much later, many centuries later, we also hear of a Damascus sword. That is not the same thing as the Mauryan uh, iron or steel. It was a different kind of uh, steel, which was Westerners called it the Woods steel. How that name came, we are not very sure. Now, this Damascus sword, which was so famous, that was made of the Woods steel, which was made in India, in many parts of India. Now, this was always uh, of great interest to the uh, Western countries. When the East India Company came to India, this was one of the things they wanted to investigate. How did the Indians make this steel? Now, the Sushruta's instruments you saw, he himself says it should be made of good quality iron. That was the Mauryan type most likely because the time corresponds to that. But when it came to many centuries later, again, that technology existed in India or something similar to that. And that is where we have some very clear records available of the 18th and 19th centuries. When a great many British observers came to India, they observed how the Indians were making the steel. And that is of great interest to us because that may be something of the kind which was used in making the original instruments of Sushruta. Now, Major James Franklin, he was a fellow of the Royal Society. He was an observer employed by the East India Company in Kolkata. He was sent to areas in Jabalpur, Jabalpur district, where this steel was being made. And he was sent there to investigate how the Indians are making this steel. Now, when he went there, he stayed and observed all the practices very carefully, made careful documentation, including diagrams. And these were sent to the in Britain, which are available, they are published. Now, there, he says in 1829, he made this report. And all the mines in that area, he made an extensive uh, survey. And he identified the best mines which were being used, the kind of ore that existed there, ore which existed in other areas, the color, the quality of the ore, and their yielding excellent malleable iron, which was being made there by these local people. And lacking the knowledge of coal, there was no coal available. They were using charcoal from burning teak and bamboo for smelting purposes. This is what was being done, as he observed. And they had two major equipment. One was a furnace, the other was a refinery. And furnace itself looked very rude in appearance, not at all impressive. But the interior dimensions were very exact. And the men who were working this, they unquestionably, to quote, unquestionably ignorant of their principle, they construct smelting furnaces with great precision. Their unit of measure is the breadth of the middle-sized man's finger, angula again, 24 of which constitute a large and 20 their small cubit. This was the measure they were using. Now, the interior dimensions measured accordingly, they were always exact. Now, he gave a similarly detailed account of the refineries. Two refineries were required for one furnace. That was their practice. 
Now, the smelting itself, here it describes the procedure they followed. A chimney of this furnace was constructed, rude outside, but exact interior. They were filled with charcoal, which is burnt and prepared from bamboo or teak. And then a small bucket of broken ore would be put inside. Then again, it would be charcoal. So, alternately, charcoal and this ore that would be packed and then it would be lit. And the scoria will start pouring out within an hour, that is what he writes there, indicating the functioning of the smelter. The metal was not completely melted by this purpose, but towards the end of this, the iron which was freed from the scoria that would deposit at the bottom of the furnace. It is never highly carbonized, which he had examined. And decarbonization, it moves next to the refinery. There are two refineries for one furnace. And the charcoal used, obtaining from teak or bamboo, again for this purpose. And it is sufficient, the iron drops to the bottom of this refinery. It is decarbonized. Now, this decarbonized iron is hammered. That is how it is, the quality is improved. And he has noted that in hammering, if they do not do it sufficiently to save their own labor, they could even pass off inferior quality, claiming that to be malleable iron. There is a malpractice even in those days. But he says, once it is properly ironed, it becomes high quality malleable iron. Now, this iron was tested in Sagar Mint. There was a mint run by the East India Company. And see the report of that uh, uh, Sagar Mint of this iron which was made, most excellent quality possessing all the desirable properties of malleability, ductility at different temperature and of tenacity and all of which I cannot, it cannot be surpassed by the best Swedish iron. That is the certificate uh, given by Colonel Pesgrave. And this was the wood steel used in making Damascus sword and probably Sushruta's instruments. We are not very sure that is speculative because wood steel came much later Sushruta's time, it is possible Maurin iron was used. We are not very sure. But anyway, the whole point is to make this kind of high precision instruments, which a whole range of them we have seen, it could not have been possible without very high quality metal. Now, the status of a technology, the important for us uh, point here, what we have to remember, this whole instrumentation technology which existed by the time early part of the say third or fourth century, uh, this whole technology practically disappeared. Because along there was a something, a great setback at that time. We will be coming to that again when we discuss surgery. Both surgery as well as surgical instrumentation industry, uh, they seem to have uh, declined very considerably over a period of time. Certainly by the fifth century, all these had practically come to a stop. Uh, this is a great uh, 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 mystery, there is no adequate explanation for this. Uh, but this decline, it transcended uh, instrumentation technology in general, whether it is uh, surgical instrumentation, whether it is surgery. In all these, there is a certain decline. And unlike Sushruta's period, when metal workers were highly respected, they were called Lohavid, they were honored, whereas these people were downgraded by 5th or 6th century the people who are making steel, for example. It, when when uh, James Franklin was asking these metal workers, why are you making it like this? Why do you have to have these billows attached at this angle? Why cannot it be done differently? And he would invariably get the reply, that we don't know. This is how my father taught me. Invariably, they would get this reply. In other words, they were unable to answer a question, why it is done like this? They could do it perfectly, a certain amount of manual skill was there, but they could not answer how. Now, that is what happened with these metal workers who gradually declined and along with surgery, the metal craft to make these instruments, that also virtually disappeared. Now, these, as they were de deprived of uh, education, they were not capable of any innovation. That is what happens if the head, we will talk about it later also. The, head and the hand, if they are not coordinated, what happens is manual skill may be there. They may be able to reproduce things exactly the same way, but they become incapable of uh, innovation. This was one of the principal reasons for the decline of uh, surgery. 
the freezing of surgery and the disappearance of surgical techniques from the mainstream of Ayurveda. It moved out from the mainstream and it only survived, survived in the hands of uh, small groups of people. They were invariably labeled as low cost. They were practicing these techniques whether it was fracture reduction or couching for cataract or these procedures. Uh, that is an unfortunate uh, part of India's history. Now, so when you come to status of surgery in ancient India, again a similar story you will find the number, the variety of instruments and their listed applications indicate that surgical practice was vigorous and prestigious in Sushruta's period. There is no uh, question about that. It was given the top position, Shalya, which we have seen. And this was practiced in Sushruta Samhita, which ins insisted on very high standards of training, experimental training apprenticeship, all these are emphasized. And these instruments were used in abundance. With the, there are special sections, uh, Sushruta says how important it is for a surgeon to be familiar, to be completely at home in the use of these instruments. More often they were used for foreign bodies, for trauma, but elective procedures were used for highly complicated operations like plastic repair of the nose, plastic repair of the ear, of lips, removal of bladder stone through the perineum, couching for cataract, all these skill used very highly skillful use of uh, instruments. But then we must remember all these surgical procedures had two severe limitations. They were subject to these two. And one was the lack of good knowledge of anatomy that was defective that we have to admit. And second was the absence of anesthesia. So subject to these two, there were great limitations in the practice of uh, surgery at that time. So these two limitations plus the decline in the use of uh, uh, technology and the battle craft, the decline, all these put together, that became the reason for the decline of surgery in Ayurveda. 